Yield is shorthand for yield to maturity, and I've covered that in a previous video quite deeply, but that was based on John Hull. I'm currently in the sub-series of Bruce Tuckman, Fixed Income Securities Assigned to FRM Candidates. So here I'll share a different perspective on yield by Bruce Tuckman, who's arguably more expert in fixed income after all, and we'll see it's compatible. But after looking at his perspective on the yield, we'll look at the two sets of implications. First, the pull-to-par set of implications, which says that when the coupon rate is equal to the yield, the bond price is at par. If the coupon is greater than the yield, the bond price is at a premium. And when the coupon is less than the yield, the bond price is at a discount. And then the bonds, as they mature, will pull to par. But we will emphasize the key assumption in that pull to par. The key assumption is that the yield does not change over time. That's an unrealistic assumption. Secondly, we'll look at something that's a little more subtle but profound, and believe it or not, that is that when we say, what's the yield curve, we've not been specific enough. The fact that there is a coupon effect means that the yield curve is not well-defined, and what that means is that we can say take the same identical term structure of spot rates, and we will get slightly different yield curves for bonds with different coupons. That's the coupon effect. Subtle but profound. And the benefit of understanding this is that you really do then have a good grasp on the yield to maturity that's so commonly used as a measure for bonds because of its key advantage, which is that unlike the term structure, which is so complex because it's filled with multiple interest rates, the yield or yield to maturity summarizes that information in a single interest rate. So I have Tuckman's example from chapter three, and it's a bond that matures in 18 months or one and a half years. It's a semi-annual pay coupon bond with a coupon rate of four and a half percent, meaning that it pays $2.25 in six months, then in one year, second coupon, and final coupon in 18 months or one and a half years of $2.25 plus return of the principal. And this bond, we observe a price of $105.85.6. I've highlighted that extra in yellow just to emphasize the fact that when we're computing the yield here, the observed, aka traded price, is an input. I've also got the same term structure that we've previously solved for in Tuckman, or truncated at least out to 18 months. So that means, of course, that we have a term structure of spot rates, also called zero rates in blue. It's upward sloping. Here are those. The discount factors that correspond directly with those spot rates. And then, as you know, if the spot rate, if the term structure of spot rates is upward sloping, the term structure of forward rates is going to be upward sloping and even more steeply. Then we'll solve for the yield, but notice that I have superimposed on my graph a plot of the yield to give an impression. I say it's an impression really because the idea is just to reinforce that the yield is a single interest rate, and that's the primary advantage in contrast to the term structure of spot and forward rates. You a term structure, after all, has to have a different interest rate at each maturity. I only have three here out of 18 months, but there are even other interest rates in between these six-month intervals. And even if we go out to a 30-year term structure, for example, can imagine we can be speaking about or referring to several different interest rates. Term structure, after all, is complex. The advantage of the yield to maturity is that we're summarizing with a single interest rate. We'll solve and see that the yield to maturity in this bond is a little less than, a little below 60 basis points. And so I've represented that as a flat line to convey the impression to emphasize the fact that that yield is a single interest rate. So it has that advantage of summarizing um, the information, both in the term structure and in the bond's price, with a single interest rate. 
Then I'll just add here the solution. And I'm not going to go into the calculation here because I've done that in previous videos for with both the calculator for exam purposes and with Excel. But you probably know we use the rate function here where I want to be mindful of my semi-annual compound frequency such that my maturity 1.5 years corresponds to three periods so that when I use the rate function here, including notice the observed price is an input into my yield as it would be on the calculator, but just being mindful of the fact that when we compute that rate, we're doing it's a six month rate. So we multiply by two as usual to translate that yield into a per annum yield in this case of 57.36 basis points, but informed by the price. So we change the price, we will change the yield. Then we come down here and this point of the, these rows is just to really highlight or emphasize what the definition of this yield is. And the definition is, of this yield is, it's the single interest rate that discounts the bond's cash flows. Future value cash flows are right here for this bond. It's the single interest rate that discounts those cash flows to a price here. Here's the discounted cash flows. The sum of those is the price that equals the price we observe. So it is an internal rate of return, an IRR, right? We can see here is my discount factor. I'm sorry, discount function is a set of three discount factors. And I've got the formula over here, but each of these discount factors are not the same discount factors up here. After all, these three discount factors are directly informed by, or they are a direct function of the term structure of spot rates in blue. So they're each using a different rate. The, the, this discount uh, function is using the same formula, one divided by $1 divided by one plus my yield divided by two semi-annual and then consistently raised to two times T. This is the same formula in each of these, although our T goes from 0.5 to 1.0 to 1.5. But the idea is that I have the same yield of 0.536 for each of these three uh, maturities, right? That's different than this discount function here. And so you can see that here, I'm using that same yield, 57 and 36 here, as I'm using here, as I'm using here. So these discount functor, these discount factors are using the yield. That yield again is the is the single interest rate that discounts all of the bonds cash flows, such that when we multiply the future cash flows by that discount factor, and then we sum those, the sum right here is the price that we observe the bond. Hence my representation here of the horizontal line, right? If I, if I use, I'm not using the discount factors implied by the spot rate. I'm using the single yield that's informed by the bond's price. I use Tuckman's example. So they happen to match. What I mean is if I take the discount factors informed by the spot rates, instead that's different and I sum those, I do get the same price if I use the um, spot rate. Why is that? Well, that's because Tuckman used as an observed price, a price that would match the theoretical bond price. Put another way, this price is neither trading rich or trading cheap. However, let me change the price. Let me now just assume that this bond is trading rich. So I'll increase the price. After all, that would be possible due to technical factors, liquidity, for example. I change the price. Price is an input into yield. The yield changes. And right, such that I discount those same cash flows I get a price that equals the price that I observe. So that yield, again, 
is a function of the price that I observe. And notice it's different now than the price I would get if I used the term structure of spot rates or of forwards. And now, so with regard to the two sets of implications that Tuckman makes, he actually itemizes six, but the first three we can all put under the pulled par dynamic here, which I've replicated his chart. And now we have a different bond. And this chart, first of all, there's a, the, the single key assumption here is that the yield is unchanged or fixed at 3%. And then we're graphing five different bonds. So these are coupon rates. So it might be easiest just to start with the flat line here in blue in the middle. That is a bond with a coupon rate of 3%. And when the yield is 3%, we see on the x-axis yields to maturity. In this case here, I'm starting at a 30-year uh, bond. So we can think about moving uh, right to left here. I'm going to think about starting right here. 30-year bond, coupon is 3%, and yield is 3%, then that bond will price to par. And if the yield is unchanged while the coupon stays at 3%, then the price as we, right, as we move to the right and as the bond approaches maturity, that's a long time, but it's gonna, the price is going to stay there at 100. After all, the no, way to think about this is, I'm getting all of the yield with the coupon and it exactly matches the yield. So there is no, there is nothing to be added by price changes. On the other hand, if we go all the way up here to the 5% bond, coupon bond, starting here at 30 years, this bond has a 5% coupon. Its yield is also 3%, right? That's the constant for all of these. This time we change the coupon. Now, if we're 30 years out and the bond pays 5%, but the yield is less, right? In this case, coupon exceeds the yield. Well, this bond must be priced at a premium. After all, the yield is only 3%, but I'm getting a 5% coupon. So I'm going to need to pay a premium for that. But as Tuckman says, over time, the value of that premium erodes. I think the opposite, the other case down here is easier to intuit, perhaps because we're closer to a zero coupon bond. But if we start here at a 30 year bond where the coupon is only 50 basis points, but the yield is 3%, our coupon itself is, doesn't nearly cover the yield of 3%. The other two and a half effectively needs to be needs to be compensation in the form of price appreci appreciation. So you can see this is getting pretty close to a zero coupon bond with a discount. We're getting the majority of the yield in this case through the expected price appreciation. And hence, that uh, that discount needs to be greater the further are, are we out. The further out we are, after all, this 3% is a per annum. So as we get closer in, this bond pulls to part. So whether the bond is a 5% coupon priced at a premium or a, a 50 basis point coupon bond priced at a discount, as they mature, going left to right, they all pull to par. That's the thing. But the assumption that is so often forgot about, forgotten about pull to par is that implicit in all of this is that the yield is not changing. It's a constant 3% here. That's a pretty strict and actually unrealistic assumption, but that's the assumption we make when we say the bonds pulled apart. His uh, Tuckman's final point about the yield is actually subtle but profound. And here we go back to the term structure of spot rates and the uh, corresponding discount uh, function, set of discount factors. And then we price three different bonds uh, according to the term structure of spot rates this this time. So in other words, we assume here that the observed market price equals the theoretical bond price. No trading rich or trading cheap. And 
price, uh, three, the bond, a zero coupon bond, a par bond, and a 9% coupon bond. So you can see here, that's just a way of uh, varying the coupon pretty dramatically from zero to a coupon that matches the yield to a 9% coupon. And then um, what I've done here is solve for the yield for each of these bonds. And then we'll notice something here. My graph is similar, but not identical to Tuckman's, where the we have plotted here a yield curve. And his point is that when we say yield curve, it's actually not specific. And we can see the truth of that the yield curve or the yields the yields yields to maturity implied by each of these bonds given the same spot rate term structure is slightly different my zero and par my zero is the highest my par is pretty close and then my 9% coupon bond its term its term its yield curve is slightly less and so this gets back to the point that the yield, if we just go out here to the two years, we can see the yields on this vary. The yield that we get depends on the bond's cash flows. Or here, I will actually read the sentence from Tuckman because I think it's instructive. The phrase yield curve is used often, but its meaning is not very precise, but because the concept of yield is intertwined with the cash flows of a particular bond. And we see that here. The cash flows of these front bonds very much vary. The zero coupon has no cash flows in any year before its actual principal payment. So because the, bond, the yield is also a function of the bond's cash flows, the yield does vary by the coupon rate. And therefore, when we say yield curve, we haven't quite been precise enough to isolate on which yield curve we're talking about. And for this reason, oftentimes, we, uh, it's convenient to just refer to the par yield or the yield curve implied by par bonds. But I hope that's helpful. And if it is, please subscribe to the channel.